The long-awaited Avatar The Last Airbender live-action Netflix series has finally arrived. And not to jump the gun or anything, but it delivered. Especially when compared to that M. Night Shyamalan live action movie we got, which I've of course talked a lot about on this channel. I hate that movie. In this video though, I'm going to go through the first four episodes of season one, breaking it down episode by episode, pointing out deeper meanings, hidden details, and just giving my thoughts overall. Now, there will be spoilers for the first four episodes, so spoiler warning. Also, if you enjoy this video, I put a lot of work into it, so please hit that like button to help with the algorithm. And if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button, and you can also follow me on all of my other social medias, all of which are linked down below, and all of which have similar content that I make here on this channel. Now that I've said that, let's get the video started. I'll be honest, for a long time, I thought this show was going to be trash, especially when the original creators left. It turns out that might have been a blessing though, because rumor has it, they wanted to change a bunch of things, but Netflix wanted their show to be faithful, and that's why they left. Them leaving gave us overall a very faithful adaptation. Who would have thought? Not me. The show overall stays true to the animated show, especially with the feel of it. It really does feel like the original series, which is all you can ask for as a fan of the original show. The costumes, the hair, the sets, the props, all of it look exactly how it looked in the animated show, but you know, live action. I love how bright and colorful the show is, and that mixed with the great cinematography and action choreography, it came together very nicely. The four directors that took on this project, each taking on two episodes, all did a seamless job of bringing their different styles to light while also matching each other, but at the same time adding their own mark to it. The thing that really makes this show though is the cast and the writing. Each character feels exactly how the character from animation felt, and it's pretty special. But now, let's get to the actual episodes. Episode 1, Aang. Instead of starting out in present day with Katara and Sokka, the Netflix show starts us off 100 years prior, which we had of course seen flashbacks of in the original show, but Netflix took it to a whole other level, the first 21 minutes being solely based on flashbacks. We begin with an action-packed chase scene in the capital city, and this sets the standard for what the fight choreography and bending will look like, and the bar is set pretty high. We then meet Sozin, who was of course the grandfather of Ozai as well as Iroh, and I love that they made him fool everyone into thinking he was going after the Earth Kingdom, when really his target was the Air Nation. We aren't the real target. My sights are set higher. It perfectly aligns with the cunning and ruthless person we got to know in animation. Then, they set the stage by having Sozin burn a man to death. And my reaction is the same as this guy back here. Like, what the f*** is going on? This is crazy. This scene tells us that this is not going to be censored like the original show. This is not a show made for kids, it's a show made for adults who grew up watching this kid show. And speaking of the original series, they immediately use the same music the animated show had, which gets a huge thumbs up from me. I'm so glad that they were able to incorporate that. Following that, we get a modified version of the intro, and it's beautifully made, even featuring previous avatars, Kiyoshi, Kurik, Yang Chen, Roku, and a lesser known avatar named Zesto. In the original show, Roku was the one who demonstrated all four elements, but here it's Kiyoshi. And this is actually a theme throughout the show, Kiyoshi taking the place of Roku. Kiyoshi also replaces Katara for the voiceover in the intro. For millennia, the four nations have lived in harmony. Which makes sense seeing as we didn't start from Katara and Sokka's point of view like the original show did. Following the intro, we stay in the past, this time with Aang in the Southern Air Temple, and we see his relationship with Gyatso, who we saw in flashbacks in episode 3 and episode 12 of the original series. The arrow on Aang's head has slight lines on it, which was an interesting choice as it sort of combines the solid animated arrow and the tattooed design arrow from the movie adaptation. The show also added an element to what would later be called Sozin's Comet, as the the airbenders have a whole festival to watch, which just so happens to bring all of the airbenders to one place for Sozin's attack. We know from extended lore though that not all of the airbenders were killed that night, and the Fire Nation had to set traps to lure the remaining airbenders and kill them there. Sort of like how the Jedi were wiped out, but some still had to be hunted by Inquisitors. And speaking of Star Wars, the Air Nomad Council Room bears a very close resemblance to the Jedi Council Room from the prequels, which makes sense seeing as they're two groups who practice peace. 
I mentioned the other avatars, Yang Chen, Kura, Kiyoshi, and Roku, and they all have a much larger role in this show, starting with each one having a statue. The first statue we see is Yang Chen's in the Southern Air Temple, and we find out that Gyatso had Aang get his arrows here, which was not customary. This makes it fitting that this is also the place where Gyatso tells Aang that he's the next avatar. One thing I really like is that friendship is a key element to this show, and I'm gonna go over this as we go. But this starts with Aang and Gyatso's friendship, and there's a really powerful line where Aang asks if he can keep pretending that Gyatso is his friend, to which Gyatso answers, You are my friend. You will always be my friend. Seeing Appa actually look good was a big relief after they did him so dirty in the live action movie. When we got the first images of the show, I was like, okay, if Appa looks good, I'm on board. But if he looks terrible, I'm out. You can't do him dirty twice in a row. Aang mentions banana cakes. Eat banana cakes. Which is a great Easter egg because that's what he and Gyatso practiced with in a flashback from the third episode of the animated series, and it landed on the head of some innocent bystanders. They also mention airball. I like to play airball. Which was the game that Aang tried to show Sokka and Katara in that same episode of the animated series. Actually seeing the Fire Nation attack was a great angle to take because we never really saw details of it. The action for this battle was once again really, really good and the airbenders actually put up a pretty good fight. We know from the episode called The Headband in the Animated Show that the Air Nation didn't have an army, they were attacked by ambush, and taking that into consideration, I'm surprised they lasted as long as they did with no army. As good of a fight as they put up though, it isn't enough, especially with the comet giving the firebenders more power, and this leads to a very thrilling, but a very sad scene as they all get taken down. One thing that I thought was really well done is how the scene of Aang getting frozen in the ice happens simultaneously with Gyatso's death, which is also a death that we didn't see in the original show, we just saw his dead body afterwards. And fittingly, look where he dies, right next to the Yang Chen statue. So three different moments happened there, Aang getting his tattoos, Aang being told he's the Avatar, and Gyatso's death. We then come to present day and see Katara trying to waterbend in the abandoned Fire Nation ship, which was there because of Hama and the other waterbenders during the raids. In the show, Katara was forbidden to go near this ship and they actually set off a trap in it, but the Netflix show skipped over that and never really talked about the ship. I love that they actually got Katara's hair loopies, which the movie was unable to do. They also got both Katara and Sokka's necklaces incredibly accurate, especially Katara's necklace. The intricate detail is amazing. Interestingly, they gave the Southern Water Tribe a name besides the Southern Water Tribe. It's now called the Cove, and this is a theme throughout as they give different names to places that probably didn't need new names, but hey, I'm down with it. When we get to the fishing scene, this is the first scene that is fully adapted from the animated show as it was the first scene in the animated show, and right away they make it clear that this show is going to be much more serious. The original scene was very silly and jokey, but here, right off the bat, they have a deep conversation about their father that gets pretty serious. And if dad were here- But he's not here. I am. We still get some joking though, especially with Sokka who jokes around just like he did in the original series. We need to get that canoe or we're gonna end up as fish food. Be ironic. Another element this new series added is this journal that Zuko makes and draws in, which houses tons of information about past avatars. In this show, he is very well versed on all things Avatar, and he even has a Yang Chen statue on his shelf, which I don't believe was the case in animation. I don't think he was this well studied person on the history of the Avatars. That's something new that the Netflix series came forth with. Zuko's scar looks amazing, and again, way better than it did in the live action movie where you could barely see it. We also see a picture of a young Zuko with his father and sister, meaning this was probably taken after their mother's death. Though if you've read the graphic novel The Search, you know that there's a lot more to that death than meets the eye. And I'll actually touch on that a bit later in part 2 of this two part series where I go over episodes 5 to 8. I'm excited to go over that because there are some things that the show brings to the table from that same graphic novel. This series added some elements to Katara and Zuko that weren't in the original show. For Katara, there's a plotline where she has to hide her waterbending and keep it a secret that she's a bender. And for Zuko, he is obsessed with becoming Fire Lord, following the Fire Nation way, and he worships his father, which wasn't as prevalent in animation, especially the part about wanting to be Fire Lord and following the Fire Nation way. Because honestly, he just wanted to come home. He didn't care so much about being Fire Lord in the original series. Katara's added element of hiding her bending does 
does make sense though, seeing as they heavily focus on her mother who sacrificed herself, saying that she was the last waterbender. I like that they highlight this, because it brings Aang and Katara to a common ground, as she's the last waterbender of her tribe, and he's the last airbender. We get a little foreshadowing for book 2 when Appa gets lost. Appa! Where's Appa? Aang is worried about where Appa is, and he blows his whistle to call him. The same whistle they used to call Appa to him in the desert in the original series. And we'll talk more about this whistle later on in the video, because there's actually a really cool detail about it. One of the most fan y moments was when Grand Grand says the intro word for word. Water, earth, fire, air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. And Grand Grand also says the name of the show, The Last Airbender. He is the last airbender. Which was actually said by Aang in the animated series, not Grand Grand. Another scene that was made more serious was Zuko arriving at the Southern Water Tribe. In animation, this was very silly with Aang coming down riding a penguin, Zuko flipping over with the hat landing on his butt, and Sokka just getting thrown aside. Here, there's no penguin, there's no slapstick comedy, and Sokka and Zuko have a real fight where Sokka actually holds his own for a minute. This also leads to a great line from Aang where he says that Sokka is the bravest person he's ever met. I think you're the bravest person I've ever met. And this line buys Sokka into finally liking Aang. This show did a good job balancing this more serious tone, while also still having the classic Avatar comedy. And this is very clear in the scene when Sokka says he's not going on Appa. There's a no way you're getting me on that- ah! This is a very funny moment, but it's not a slapstick joke. They pretty much removed all of that for the adaptation. In this scene, Aang steals Zuko's journal, which as I said, was a notebook that wasn't in the original series. Aang having this book is what tells both Aang and the audience a lot of information that we would have gotten in episodes or scenes that were cut for time's sake, which honestly was a really smart way of doing it. A cool easter egg I noticed is that Aang's staff has the airbending logo on it. That was a really nice detail. Moving to the end of the episode, in the scene where Aang finds Gigato's body and goes into the Avatar state is slightly different, as it's not Katara that brings him out of it, but rather his friendship with Gigato, which plays on that theme of friendship I mentioned the show really highlights. You are my friend. You will always be my friend. Episode 2, Warriors. Right off the bat, we're introduced to Momo in this episode, and I love the dynamic the show wrote for Momo and Sokka as they have a love-hate relationship. I bet you taste like chicken. The show cut the pirate arc out, meaning they had to find another way to get Katara the waterbending scroll, and they did this by having Grand Grand pack it for Katara, saying that she had been keeping it for years, waiting for the right time. This also plays into the arc of Katara hiding her bending while she was in the Southern Water Tribe. I love that Aang took a moment to bury his old teacher and friend Gyatso and the actor for Aang nails this emotional scene. Another great piece of acting, though for a very different reason, was Zuko's reaction to Iroh interrupting him mid-sentence when he spotted sticky rice. You need to have sticky rice. Uncle. He just nails the physical comedy. Bringing animated faces, expressions, and movements to life is very difficult, and he nailed it here. We get another statue that honors an avatar, this time for Kyoshi, and it actually lights up and identifies Aang, which is cool. This show added a new character, that being Suki's mother, who was actually the leader of Kyoshi Island. This adds a lot to Suki's character arc, as it brings on the added development of her mother not letting her leave the island, which Suki sort of resents her mother for. Another thing this episode changed was the sexist behavior of Sokka. People were up in arms about this when it was leaked, but I wasn't too bothered by it. I said that I'm honestly fine with it as long as they find another rift between Sokka and Suki. And unfortunately, they didn't. Instead of their rift being about Sokka being sexist, their rift comes forth because Suki is put off by the fact that Sokka says he's the leader to protect his home, but isn't there protecting it right now. This might work if it wasn't for Suki literally just saying that she's the head warrior for her home, but wants to leave herself. That puts you in the same spot as Sokka. There's some other weird stuff between Sokka and Suki, including a scene where Suki just watches Sokka with his shirt off and doesn't say a word. What the f was that? This weird scene is followed by a scene I actually really like though, this time with Katara and Aang. Aang starts by hyping Katara up, which helps her with her waterbending, 
But then it gets serious as Aang talks about Gyatso. Gyatso used to be the one who trained me. The scene lightens up though as Katara hits Aang with waterbending, and they have a nice fun moment that's very faithful to how their dynamic in the original series was. We also get a very fanservice-y moment as Aang runs into the statue just like he did in the intro of the animation. And speaking of fanservice, Sokka pulls out his boomerang and also stretches the exact same way he did in animation. This then leads into an actual good Sokka and Suki moment. Thank god, it's about time. And they do some fight choreography that turns into a bit of lust just like in the original series. One thing I wish they added though was Sokka being put in the Kyoshi Warrior gear. I thought that was the really crucial moment for his character arc. But at the same time, they did cut him being sexist, and that was the whole basis for putting him in that getup, so I guess it's not really that necessary. One thing really cool about this series is that they took lore from not just the original TV show, but from lore that has since been released after the series ended. This includes the fact that Kyoshi was an orphan, which came from the Kyoshi novels that were released a few years ago. Team Avatar found this out from Zuko's journal, and they also discover how the Avatar has past lives from this journal. This was something that Aang learned from Roku in the original series, and you can really see how crucial this notebook becomes for the writers who are adapting this series, as it sort of becomes their go-to to tell the audience something they need to know. I think it's a brilliant idea, and honestly, this is a great example of how to adapt something well. Speaking of the past avatars, and more specifically Roku, he is not the first avatar to speak to Aang like in the original show. Instead, Kyoshi speaks to him first, and she preaches about strength, which very much aligns with what we know about her in the lore of Avatar. She also shows Aang the Northern Water Tribe being destroyed, which is of course the future, and this is what motivates Aang to go to the Northern Water Tribe, whereas in the animated show, he wanted to go there to get a waterbending master. I saw a lot of people upset about this change, but me personally, I don't really see a problem with it. We're also introduced to Commander Zhao in this episode, and he has a much larger role than he did in the animated show. In this episode, he's the one who marches on Kyoshi Island before Zuko gets there, while in the original show, he was not present for this, it was just Zuko and his men. The action here is awesome, and it starts with a crazy move from Suki's mother. Like damn, holy shit, where did that come from? Then, the action gets ramped up, as Kyoshi actually takes over Aang's body, similar to how Roku took over Aang's body in episode 8 of the original series, and also how Kyoshi did the same thing in book 2 episode 5 to clear her name. This leads to honestly what might be one of the coolest scenes in the whole show. This is then paired with Sokka and Suki fighting side by side in slow motion, and we see Sokka block Zhao's fire blast with a fan, similar to how he did in the original show. After the battle, we see Sokka and Suki have their little moment, and they both get something out of this relationship. Suki thanks Sokka for bringing the world to her, and the thing that Sokka gained was Suki making him realize that he shouldn't end his mission with Aang here, which he said he was going to do at the beginning of the episode, and he instead decides to continue his journey with Aang. The episode ends with Zhao betraying Zuko, writing to the Fire Lord to tell him that the Avatar is back, even though he promised Zuko that he wouldn't tell anyone, much less the Fire Lord himself. We then end with Ozai, and the line he delivers had to be heavily inspired by Mark Hamill's voice acting from the original show, because he sounds just like him here. The Avatar has returned. Episode 3, Omashu. This episode starts by introducing us to Azula, who has the perfect introduction as she pretends to be a victim helping these rebels, only to stab them in the back and turn them over to Ozai. Then she smiles as she watches them all burn to death. It's perfect. This is the best way to introduce a character like Azula. I'm so happy with it. Obviously, Azula shows up much sooner than she did in the animated show, where she wasn't introduced until the final shot of book one. But I have to say, if you have a good reason to bring a character in, then do it. And they definitely did have a good reason, as we see her start working with Zhao. And we also see Azula's dynamic with her father, as well as their friends Mei and Tai Li, who were also introduced in this episode. And might I just say, they were perfectly cast as well, and their costumes and hair were done perfectly. It looks exactly how it did in animation. It's also funny that they were introduced in an episode called Omashu, because their official first appearance in the animated show was in an episode called Return to Omashu in Book 2. Judging from the title of this episode, you can probably guess that it does take place in the city of Omashu, 
and they absolutely nailed this city. Just like Mei and Tai Lee, it looks exactly how it did in the original show. This episode actually combined four different episodes from the original series, which is actually really impressive. Its main base is on episode 5 called King of Omashu, where they arrive at the city. Then it also brought in Jet and the Freedom Fighters from episode 10 called Jet, as well as Teo and his father the Mechanist from episode 17 called the Northern Air Temple, and it pays homage to episode 11 called the Great Divide, as Sokka and Katara choose two groups to side with and argue defending that side, just like they did in the canyon. Jet's not the bad guy, Sai is. Are you kidding me? Sai has done nothing but help us, while Jet's a con artist who lied to our faces. With so many stories coming together, they actually did a great job of balancing it all, and Omashu sort of becomes the base of all different stories coming together, which is pretty cool. But anyway, they hit all the points that needed to be hit, from Sokka working with the Mechanist and realizing its potential as an engineer, to the Mechanist being a traitor making weapons for the Fire Nation, and also Katara trusting Jet only to be wrong, and Jet trying to kill people. Like Mei and Tai Lee, the Freedom Fighters look exactly how they looked in animation, which is great attention to detail. Jet even has the piece of grass that he chews on. I also love the part where Katara mixes up who Pipsqueak is. Thanks, Pipsqueak. He's the Duke. I'm Pipsqueak. It's interesting that they paired both the Freedom Fighters and the Mechanist, because they both have similar plot lines. We think they're good at first, but then we find out that they're not, and they're actually misguided and wrong. For the Netflix series, we find out that the Freedom Fighters were behind a bombing that they framed the Fire Nation for, and they used blasting jelly to do it, which Jet famously said not to mix up with jelly candy, one of my favorite lines from the original series. There are some great Katara and Jet moments, like Jet helping Katara master the Water Whip, which he does by telling Katara to remember the good parts about his mother Kaya, and not just about her death. We also get some more fan service with the Cabbage Merchant. My cabbage! Yeah! Which I think is the best fan service you can give Avatar fans, let's be honest. Everybody loves the Cabbage Merchant. In this episode, we also follow Iroh and Zuko as they sneak into Omashu. And while there, Zuko and Aang get into a fight, which is honestly one of the most impressive examples of choreography the show has, using all sorts of things to aid in the fight, from baskets, to plates, and even hanging clothes. The episode ends with Iroh sacrificing himself so that Zuko could get away, which definitely reminded me of how he did this for Team Avatar at the end of Book 2 in the original show. And along with Iroh being captured, they also capture Aang. Uh -oh. Episode 4, Into the Dark. This episode opens with a thought-provoking conversation between Aang and Iroh about Zuko. I'm really starting to see what kind of person he is. I doubt that. Iroh then mentions those they lost. My brother, the Fire Lord, sees things through only one lens. Victory or defeat. Nothing else matters. Not even the loved ones lost along the way. And he's of course thinking about his son, Luten. This line was delivered so perfectly and with so much emotion, it made me emotional. We get a flashback to young Boomy, who made Aang a carving, and he says it's supposed to be a badger mole. It's supposed to be a badger mole. Badger moles are the original earthbenders, and these creatures are of course actually introduced in this episode. The present day Boomy is introduced, and I love that they made him snort when he laughs just like in the original series. <laughs> One thing I don't really like though, is that Aang finds out who Boomy is right away, taking away that added element that I think made this episode so special, that big reveal at the end. I do like their back and forth though, as Aang asks Boomy how he's still alive, and Boomy asked Aang why he's still a child. How are you still alive? I'm still a child. I also love that they put a bunch of yes men around Boomy who just laugh at everything he says, even though he has the lamest jokes imaginable. Short ribs from Kangaroo Island. They practically jump into your mouth! <laughs> This episode, like the last, combines multiple episodes from the original series, as it again has episode 5, the King of Umashu as its base with King Bumi. Then it also has episode 7, the Spirit World, with Iroh being captured and taken by the Earth Kingdom guards, as well as an episode from book 2 called The Cave of Two Lovers, which surprised me seeing as they're adapting book 1, not book 2. However, I'm not gonna lie, I got pretty excited when I saw this band, and I immediately knew what was coming. While in the cave, we get a beautifully made animation carved into the wall as they tell the tale of the two lovers and the origin of the city of Omashu. Meanwhile, Aang goes through the trials of Bumi, but instead of doing this to save Katara and Sokka like in the original series, he's doing it to save himself so he can get to the north. 
I know I keep saying this, but the choreography here was pretty awesome, as Aang does a Matrix-like move to avoid a huge boulder. However, unfortunately, it goes downhill fast, as Sokka arrives and lamely slides into the fight. You have such great choreography throughout the show, but every once in a while, you'll get something like this that really takes you out of it. I also think it's hilarious that they cast a young guy to play old man Boomy just so he could be ripped like he was in the animated series. And you gotta give him credit, they made him look exactly like his animated counterpart, complete with the white armpit hair. The series added an element to the soldiers that captured Iroh, as we find out that one of them lost their brother during the siege of Ba Sing Se, a siege led by Iroh many years ago. The soldier takes the opportunity to play mind games with and physically beat Iroh as payback. He goes as far as to say that Iroh knows nothing of loss, which again reminds him of the son he lost during that same siege. This then leads to an amazing flashback of Lu Ten's funeral, and while everyone just pays their respect and leaves, when Zuko approaches, instead of walking away like everyone else, he actually sits down with his uncle and joins him while he mourns. Then as it zooms in on Iroh, he begins to cry with a quivering lip. And let me tell you, I lost it here. I was crying real tears. It's up there with the tales of Ba Sing Se, which makes every Avatar fan cry so many tears. Getting back to the show, in present day, Zuko has an interesting plotline. Twice, he's faced with a decision to either save his uncle or capture Aang, and both times he chooses his uncle. What is it, Zuko? Nothing. Remember when I said that the theme of friendship was very prevalent in the series? Well, this episode is a prime example of that, as Boomy tells Aang that he can't rely on his friends to save the day, but as it turns out, they came to his rescue and Aang proves Boomy wrong. Aang then whips out the carving that Boomy made for him, and Aang says that he uses it to call another friend, referring to Appa. So Appa's whistle was made by Boomy. That is such a cool detail. Then, this theme of friendship is taken even further, as we get a flashback of Zuko being banished and Iroh saying he'll join him. When Zuko says he doesn't need a babysitter though, Iroh says, How about a friend? I love this too, because looking at both flashbacks, Zuko was there for Iroh during his time in need, and Iroh was there for Zuko in his time of need. This flashback is also similar to a flashback we saw in the animated show from Book 3, where Zuko has that same bandage over his eye. The episode ends with the Mechanist redeeming himself by warning Boomy of a coming attack from the Fire Nation. Then, Boomy and Aang ride down the slide, just like they did as kids in the original series flashback, and they crash and blow something up. And from audio alone, we realize who they hit. My cabbages! And that's a breakdown of the first four episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender Season 1. Stay tuned for my breakdown of the back half of this season as I go over episodes 5 to 8. In the meantime, comment below your thoughts on the series so far. I'm excited to hear what you guys have to say, and please use my comment section as a place to talk to other Avatar fans about this show. Have some conversations, have fun with it, and embrace your inner Avatar nerd. That's all I have for you guys now though, but I will see you in part 2 as we go over episodes 5 to 8.